Okay. Our third speaker this morning is Katie McLaughlin. She's worn many hats over the years. She's been a software developer for many languages, a system administrator in multiple operating systems, and a speaker on many different topics. She's going to talk about JavaScript from probably more than one angle today. Katie. When she's not changing the world, she enjoys making tapestries, cooking, and yelling at JavaScript, and its attempt at global variables. Yay! Okay. G'day. Has anyone seen these two books before? On the left we have JavaScript and on the right we have JavaScript, the good parts. <laughs> the one on the right is by one Douglas Crockford. Hi, I'm Katie. As was wonderfully introduced, I enjoy cooking, making tapestries, and yelling at JavaScript at its attempt at global variables. Because if you've ever actually used JavaScript before, you can you know that it's a little bit annoying at some things. So if we have an answer in our console, this is going to be our JavaScript console for the rest of the talk, and we initialize this variable, and then we say have a function which uses this variable, assigns it, and then returns it. If we get our original answer, it's just going to be an empty string. If we run the output of our function, we're going to get the answer that we expect. But if we try to get our variable out again, it's going to be the original because of that thing in there, which is a var, which is you're supposed to use and you're not, and it's really confusing. And oh, I hate JavaScript. You know what else is horrible in JavaScript? Duck typing, because if it looks like a duck and it sounds like a duck, it's a duck. So if we want to do some really simple addition in JavaScript, you can go 4 plus 2 equals 6. Yeah, that's fine. You can also do um, negation and minusing, which is fun. So you can have 4 minus 2 is 2. And say if you have a weird input, you can have the string of 4 minus 2, which is going to be 2. That's great. And if we go back to the addition, of course, the answer is going to be 42. <clears throat> and then you have arrays and objects. So if you try to add two arrays together, you get an empty string. Um, okay, if you add an array and an object together, you get an object. If you add an object and an array together, you get zero because transitivity, what's that? And if you try to add two objects together, it's not a number. <laughs> because arrays don't actually equal objects, but they do kind of because you can declare an array and you can print out your array and it's an array of A, B and C. And you can have a um, key defined within an array and that's perfectly valid and it doesn't explode and it returns back your key value, which is fine. But then if you print out your array again, it's not actually there. But if you were to loop through your array, it is there. And if you were to append to your array, you get four, because that's a lengthy array. That makes sense. So if I was to loop around my array again, I actually have five elements, even though the length is four. <clears throat> and equality, because zero is equal to false is true. And one is one is one, right? But you have this wonderful thing where instead of double equals, you have triple equals because zero isn't actually equal to false. And one isn't actually equal to the string one. So in all these examples, you can see how um, developers can just get a little bit upset about JavaScript. A couple of examples. Please do not hire me for my JavaScript abilities. I am proficient enough in the language to loathe it entirely. This is from an old manager of mine whose friend then goes, yes, I've been around them. They swear a lot when they hack in JavaScript. Um, and if you go back to old JavaScript, it's just like, what did I do? What is this? What is that? I have no idea what I'm doing. Or in, in the words of the wonderful uh, Swift on security, I don't like JavaScript. I'll write some more JavaScript to fix it, and this is how Angular happens. <laughs> so here's the thing. Why? Why is Java so, JavaScript so horrible, and why do people hate it so much? So I could give a whole history of JavaScript. I'm going to give it in 30 words or less. If you want to have a really good understanding of JavaScript and how it came to be, highly recommend the gentleman whose book was in the first one, uh, Douglas Crockford. He has an entire theater series on Crockford on JavaScript. Really good series, about 10 hours worth. Highly recommended. But in 30 words or less, in 1995, JavaScript was developed in 10 days by Brendan Eich for Netscape in order to offer a lightweight version of Java in order to compete for users with Microsoft. That's a mouthful, so let's step through it. So, 10 days. That might explain a few things. Um, it was developed in 10 days by Brendan Eich for Netscape. He originally was commissioned to write a scripting language for Netscape 
in order to compete with Internet Explorer, and he wanted to base it off Scheme. That's Scheme. Aren't you glad we didn't end up with Scheme? <clears throat> so, because of the issues of having, say, a lightweight version of Java for usability and all this stuff, Scheme wasn't actually accepted as the uh, basis to base all this off. There is a whole lot of stuff in Scheme in there, but the syntax is very much like Java. And the problem with this is that that's Java. <laughs> well, so Netscape needed a scripting language in order to have a more interactive, adaptive web, and this is what we use today, and it's really awesome. This all happened because Mosaic split into Netscape and Spyglass, and Netscape said, we're going to wipe out Microsoft in the browser division, and Microsoft went, nope, we're going to buy Spyglass now, and that turned into Internet Explorer. And it was this race to try to allow more developers to do more things, and it was really fun because Microsoft ended up reverse engineering the JavaScript that Netscape made so much so that they actually reverse engineered all the bugs in it. Yeah, they called it JScript. But it was called JavaScript. Originally it was LightScript and then it was JavaScript because it had influences from Java. So technically JavaScript is now a trademark of Oracle because Sun and Netscape and Sun and now Oracle. And yeah, so technically what we're actually using is ECMA script, a general purpose cross program platform language. The reason this ECMA comes up is because Netscape wanted to standardize their language, JavaScript. They may have annoyed uh, Tim Berners-Lee a little bit, so the uh, W3C mob refused to standardize them, so they had to go around to another place to get standards happening, which is how they ended up in Europe, which is the European uh, Computer Manufacturers Association, which is where we get ECMA from. So it's ECMA or ECMA script, but I'm just going to call it JavaScript because that's what I've been calling it for how long I've been using it. So JavaScript is the most popular language ever. How can we actually validate this? Well, how many people use the internet in this room? How many people run JavaScript disabled? Okay. I use Linux. <laughs> <laughs> For a non-technical group of people, most people wouldn't even know how to disable JavaScript. There are billions of people that use the internet nowadays. Most of them are going to not be disabling JavaScript, which means that there are billions of users of JavaScript, which means you have the biggest user base ever for a language. And because of that, you have millions of developers, which means that when you have anger and disgust at JavaScript because you have so many people being angry and disgusted at it, it looks like it's really awful when it's just the amount of noise that's happening. Because there are a buttload of complaints about JavaScript. Um, I, I submitted this talk and I just had a JavaScript search in Twitter and the amount of vitriol that comes out. People, I learned some new swear words. Um, but the whole 10 days thing means that there are a whole lot of foot guns in JavaScript. Foot guns being you can shoot yourself in the foot with it. So, global variables. Coming back through our examples from earlier, what's happening here is that the top declaration variable is actually global, while the inset one is local, even though it's overloading the same variable name, which means that we end up with we're referencing in the second line the inner variable and in the last line the outer variable, which makes it really fun because by default, if you don't declare a variable with var, it's global because every other language you have to actually set global if you mean global, which is really confusing for anyone else who's used anything that's not JavaScript. We'll get to Perl. <laughs> we will get to Perl. So, the string issues from earlier was because of the overloaded plus operand, because what's happening here is we have implicit Java-esque things where it sees that there's a four and we're trying to do a negation, so it goes, oh, that four might actually be a number, but in the second one, it's a string because the overloaded variable is a concatenation as opposed to an addition. And then we have equality and type coercion because the triple equals is there because the first one assumes that it will 
do type coercion first before the equality and the second one doesn't. Now, this was picked up very, very early by Brendan Eich when he was developing it, and he asked the Standards Committee whether they could change it. They wouldn't accept that change because backwards compatibility is a thing. So what you should always do is always use the triple equals because that'll actually check things properly because you really don't want zeros equaling false. And not a number. Hoo -hoo 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 -hoo. Not a number is fun. So not a number is actually a number. Uh, two not a numbers are not equal to each other. Actually not equal. But there is a wonderful function called is finite because is finite nan is actually false. So to actually check whether a value is a number, you have to check it's a number and then check it's a number. OK, that's fine. Ah, parse integer. Oh, this one's a fun one. So if I have a number and I parse it out, 1, 2, 3, I'll get 1, 2, 3. However, parse int stops when it sees a non-digit character. So that string parses out to the exact same thing. And it's really fun because if you have leading zeros in some cases, it'll, well, that works. It's a four, right? Uh, no, because that last one is actually being worked out to be an octal. And octal eight doesn't work because octal is base eight and there's no eight integer, just like in base 10, there's no 10 integer. So that's fun. Uh, numbers in general. Ha 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 ha. Four plus two is six. What's 40 plus 20? 60. What's 0. 0.4 plus 0. 0.2? 0. 0.611111. Done. Because all numbers in JavaScript are floats, including integer array indexes are actually floats. Yeah. Oh, extended character sets. So this is fun. JavaScript was created around the time that Unicode was just starting to be a thing, but not really popularized. So there's a little bit of fun with trying to handle Unicode and native JavaScript. So if I have a string and I split it by an empty string, I end up getting every character in a string. If I do this with Unicode or emoji, as it were, I, I get some interesting things because those emoji are actually using two separate characters to encode them because it's the extended character set. Two what bytes. two bytes exactly, and we're splitting by each particular thing. You get a chocolate from earlier. <laughs> See Ben later. Um, what you should be doing is, you, if you have an array from, it'll actually handle it properly and it'll split out your, all your emoji. So if you're handling emoji in JavaScript, I'm sorry, but if you're handling emoji in JavaScript, make sure you're using the functions that actually understand what emoji are. Oh, this thing. Oh, so this is one I found on Twitter. This is fun. Can anyone take a guess what this is? <laughs> oh, brain fuck. No, this is valid JavaScript. Do you know what it actually um, equates to? Three. Ten. <laughs> so let's step through this. We have a empty array, and an empty array is actually a empty string because it's a, an empty array and a single character and a single character being the string and all that kind of fun stuff. But what you can do is you can use the unary additive operand to cast that empty string into a number. So you get that. And then what you can do is you can have arrays and arrays and arrays with an additive thing and then you end up getting an empty string that can actually be incremented. And that's how you get your one. And then you do the same thing from before, and then you get your 10. Which is really fun and really obscure, and these kind of things in JavaScript are totally valid, but they don't make sense to a human. We'll get back to that later. Ha ha, placement. So arrays are objects, but kind of not really, because um, you've got, say, a type of, of a, that's an object, is an object. Type of an array is an object but they're actually different, but we'll get back to that later. So type of in itself is really fun because it'll actually show you the type of an object. And say type of object, which is an object. Type of number is a number. Type of string is a string. Type of Boolean is a Boolean. Yay, can anyone guess what type of null is? An object. Would you like to know why this happens? Does anyone here know C? I'm going to teach you some C, by the way. I should have probably put a uh, disclaimer at the front. There will be C in this talk. There will be Perl later. 
So, in the underlying code of how JavaScript was implemented back in the 1990s, there was this wonderful thing where they decided, oh, I'm going to encode a tag at the front of all my actual objects. The tag for object is zero. The tag, the act, entire <laughs> object, the pointer of null is null, is, is the empty object as well. And so you have all these wonderful things with numbers and strings and booleans and stuff. So here's the actual C code. And we have highlighted, if you can see it, a great big if then else tree, which is fun because what happens is we check it's a void. We know it's not a void. And then it goes, hi, do you have this tag at the front of your object? Well, actually, yeah, you do because you're an empty pointer and I'm just checking whether that tag is zero. So apart from are you a function, this it could have been a function, but it's, it's not a function. So instead, we hit the else, which is an object, and then we end up getting type of object. Yes. This is a bug. This is a very known old bug. And the problem is backwards compatibility. <laughs> JavaScript is the most popular language. It has billions of users. Of all the languages that should never, ever, ever, ever have changes to their underlying fundamental structure to ensure backwards compatibility, JavaScript is the one language that should never do that. Because the internet would break entirely. We're getting there. You know what else is fun with JavaScript? Security. So if you were in Ben's talk, you would have heard the wonderful things that you can do with PHP. Um, you can also do these kind of things client side, such as cross-site scripting, which is always fun because you really, really, really don't want outside people to be able to interact with the uh, variables within your client session. And you also have this wonderful thing called eval because JavaScript has eval. So. If you obscure your input enough, you would have no idea what this actually does. Who thinks that they would be perfectly happy to run this on their production client-side server? Can anyone take a guess of what this actually does? If you want to learn more about security, come to our workshop tomorrow. It's not being recorded. <laughs> so <laughs> that's JavaScript. Stuff JavaScript. I don't want to use JavaScript. I don't want to have to deal with all this stuff. I'll use a framework. <laughs> so we have things like MooTools and jQuery and Bootstrap. And jQuery at one point was on 90% of all websites that even had any sort of JavaScript. And MooTools, I unfortunately only know because I had to get rid of it. Um, and then you have things like Bootstrap, which have a whole lot of fun with uh, CSS and styling as well, because you want to be concentrating on making your functionality and not lining up your responsive grid designs. But if you want to have something new, newer and shinier, you can use one of these wonderful frameworks that I have no idea about except for the bottom one, which is Angular, which Taylor Swift was upset about, and React, which is apparently fancy, and Meteor, which, apart from its apocalyptic naming convention, is apparently really cool and awesome. But you know what? Stuff JavaScript altogether. I don't want to do JavaScript at all. I'm going to use one of these languages, which reduces down to uh, JavaScript. So we have CoffeeScript, which is a um, wonderful little, little language that uh, reports to compile into Java underneath all the awkward Java-esque pinata. JavaScript always has a gorgeous heart. There you go. Um, TypeScript lets you write JavaScript in a way that you really want to with types. Okay, And PureScript, which is another one of those fun functionally things. Um, yes. So. You know what? I don't want to learn another language. I'm, I just want to. I just want to use what I always know. I want to use Perl. I want to use Python, but I want to do it in a browser. People have done that for you. Pick any language you want, and there will be a thing that will reduce it down into JavaScript for you. And there's a whole lot of cross compilers at the moment, including a compiler that does Perl. Uh, sorry, Brainfuck and Go which Paul found earlier, so sorry. It's already been done. But yes, you can. Paul will be doing the lightning talk later, asterisk. Um, if you go to this particular uh, GitHub wiki page, you can find a list of all the curated things of things that were compiled down to JavaScript. And some of my favorites, Batavia. It has this cool little logo. I have stickers, if anyone wants. If you've been to a PyCon AU talk, you would have heard of Batavia. Um, it allows you to import compiled Python bytecode 
into your session and then run a JavaScript virtual machine on it. It's actually really cool. Looking for contributors, by the way. And also you have this wonderful things like um, ASM and Inscripten because it is now possible to put C code into JavaScript, which means that you can have stuff like this, which is Windows 95 running in a browser. <laughs> That URL is real, it will work. Please do not do it on the conference Wi-Fi as it is a fairly large download and it is also has a whole lot of disclaimers saying, by the way, you know you're gonna be running Microsoft, yeah, Microsoft, copyright Microsoft, but it works, and that's the thing. Sorry? <clears throat> you know what, all these things about JavaScript are really cool. I want to learn more JavaScript. So JavaScript outside of the browser has a whole lot of incredible applications such as Node because server-side JavaScript. Now, I, I made the mistake of saying that I don't like Node because I don't want JavaScript anywhere near my hardware, and I was told off for it. And it's, I mean, ECMA script is supposed to be general purpose, and I've come out with this bias of I don't like JavaScript. No, I actually don't like what people do with JavaScript. Node actually looks kind of cool. I haven't played with it a lot, but I have heard of this thing, which is Electron, which is GitHub's framework to allow you to write desktop applications in JavaScript cross-operating system, and it's actually really cool. This is a very new, exciting thing because Node and Electron and stuff are all these cool hipster fun words, except you've been actually able to run JavaScript on your desktop for a while now. Who remembers Google Gadgets? Yes, I have a few people. Google Gadgets was awesome because you could have little draggable widgets around your desktop. Um, this was all JavaScript because the exact same widgets you can run on your desktop could run on your iGoogle. So that's pretty cool. And as a scripting language, uh, Nginx has announced but possibly not yet released the ability to use EngineScript, which is JavaScript to write your Nginx rule sets. And that's kind of cool. And Cinnamon, a uh, wonderful little uh, window manager type thing, also uses JavaScript. So that's kind of cool. But with, with more power comes greater responsibility because there's some other fun bugs with uh, the V8 and other such server-side engines. Um, if I was to have a function that just has a really long comment and doesn't actually do a lot and then just runs in a loop for a while, I can time that and it'll take just under two seconds. So there's my before. Here's my after. All I'm doing is removing the last line of the comment and it runs in a third of the time because there's an issue in the V8 optimization engine that any function longer than 600 characters goes through a different optimization loop. That includes comments. <laughs> but it's okay because JavaScript is improving. ECMA Script 5 was uh, introduced as a standard in around 2009 and most browsers have finally picked it up. So in version in version 3, sorry, if you were to parse an integer of that 8 octal from before, you would get 0. But now in number 5, it'll work out that that's probably actually base 10. What you should be doing is always declaring your radix, your base, to make sure that it always comes out because not all browsers have fully implemented ECMA script 5 yet. And is array is now a thing that you can actually check whether something is an array. So the object isn't an array and the array is an array. So it's like, Yay, I have a thing that I can actually test now as opposed to my arrays being objects, which was annoying. And trim. Trimming of strings is now native JavaScript functionality 14 years after JavaScript was developed. So instead of having to say trim left or trim right, you can actually trim both at the same time. So that's kind of cool. And then we have ECMA script 6, which was just approved in June this year and is still very much not adopted yet because every single browser has to eventually include all this tech. That's perfectly reasonable, right? But once your browser gets it, oh, will it be fun? You get block scoping of variables, finally, which means that instead of having var in our very first example, you can use let instead, which is explicit block scope and you cannot use, if that variable is undefined anywhere else, you get errors, brilliant errors, actual breaking errors as opposed to meh errors. And importing, oh, importing, you can import now 
you never could import before, now you can import if you do the funky magic syntax, which means that you don't have to go scripts or scripts or scripts, or you can actually import JavaScript from your JavaScript, so you can JavaScript all your JavaScript, it's gonna be awesome. And what other uh, changes in the last 20 years that have happened that are finally getting into JavaScript is the spread operator, which allows you to declare a function that takes as many arguments as you want. Doesn't matter, you don't have to declare an arguments array and then work out the length and then cast all your things around. And that's going to be very shiny. The problem is the adoption will happen. Uh, Firefox is very much on top of this. Chrome, yeah, IE, meh. Uh, Safari, ugh. But there is a compatibility table that people are curating which shows you exactly what's going on. Which is also really fun when you dive into the UCMA specs for this stuff because there's a whole lot of non-standard standards. Um, console.log isn't actually a mandated thing anywhere. It's just something that a couple of people have decided is a good idea and have re-implemented it. So technically you should never rely on this actually existing in the browser. But there's a whole lot of fun things you can actually do with console.log that you might not know. So if I have a variable that's 42 and I want to print it out to console, that's fairly standard, concatenate a string, dump it out. What you can also do is fun things like console.time and I start a timer, I do a thing, I end the timer, and then it automatically prints out how long it took. That's kind of cool. And you can also do uh, cascading style sheets within your string. So you can actually have really, really big red errors, which is how Facebook's inspection, inspect console ends up getting that really big stop and the really big text, because what they've done is they've actually put in big red letters somewhere in their output, don't do this. And that's actually really effective when you're not expecting to see style sheets in your console log. And that's fine. It's perfectly valid. Also, yeah, actually read that thing. It's quite interesting. Um, so even though we don't have the adopted standards yet, they are coming, but you can do this wonderful thing called polyfill, which is actually really cool. And I only just discovered it researching this talk that it actually has a name where you explicitly extend the prototype functionality of JavaScript in order to get all the cool, shiny new things now. And you can do things like add in supplant, which was a rejected uh, introduction into ECMA script six, which allows you to do native templating. So if I have a string with a whole lot of curly braces and I have a object with keys that match what's in my curly braces, I can do a supplant and substitution. And that's cool because you no longer have to rely on moustache or handlebars or whatever hipster names are around now. You can actually do that native JavaScript with just this one function. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to say, if it's not already defined, define a thing and then there's a fancy little regex and that will work now and it will continue to work even when supplant becomes a thing because it won't overload with your version. So that's cool. And you can also do that with is array as a polyfill. So you can explicitly say, if I call this function, I want to compare my array with the object array. So that's fine. And what you're supposed to do in the case of console.log, if you actually rely on it for anything, is polyfill it and use alert if console.log doesn't exist. So we get back to alert-based debugging. Who remembers alert-based debugging? Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, it's still not standardized. You're going to be putting up with it for a while. So JavaScript isn't awful, it's awful, it's full of awe. And it's absolutely amazing that we've been able to take something that can be broken in so many places but brilliant in so many others and make the web as it exists today. When it's the glue, when that's the glue that the, of the modern day web, it's a minor miracle that society even functions. But, but just keep in mind that JavaScript isn't the only language on the planet, other languages have what's as well. Let's talk about Java. If I want to read a file in Java, I can declare where my file sits and then I can invoke some spaghetti code to read it. Buffered file reader, buffered input reader, buffered input stream. Let's talk about Ruby. In Ruby, you can't do bare words because those, those variables do not exist yet. However, I can declare method missing to have a function that's called whenever I have functions that can't be called. So what I can do is just print out the string this is how Rails works. It is very not nice when you realize how it does its magic. Because in Rails, you can do things like have a function that doesn't exist anywhere, 
that is underscore separated that will actually get parsed as input variables as a function name. Ugh. Let's talk about Ruby. In Ruby, if I have not true and and false, it's false because we have a and operator in there and what we're doing is we're checking whether not true and true is actually equated and stuff. So, boolean, yeah? If I was to use and instead of double and, you expect this result to be the same. It's not because the precedence of the order of operations, double and comes before not, comes before single and. And so you get fun stuff like this. Let's talk about Haskell. Yay! Yay. What's the length of an array, of that array? What is it, Fraser? It's two. It's two. What's the length of a tuple? One. It's one. Because what we're doing is fancy functional stuff. We're actually folding over this tuple. And so the length of the tuple is actually one, and that's completely valid. This tricks up a lot of people that aren't used to functional programming. Let's talk about Haskell. If I let a variable a be 2 plus 2, then a is 4. I can let b be 2 plus 2, where 2 plus 2 equals 5, and that is completely valid. <laughs> that is valid in, yes, what? Let's talk about Python. So if I have an array, in, if I have a variable in Python that's 256 and another one that's 256, and I try to check whether they're the same object, that's true. If I have a variable that's 257 and another one that's 257 and I check whether they're the same object, they're not. <laughs> but if I declare them on the same line and then check, they are. <laughs> check out that talk at the bottom by this amazing lady who did a thing at PyCon US and it explains all about that. Let's talk about Perl. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so what's the output of this if I want to check whether foo and bar are equal strings? That will print true because in Perl, that is actually number equality and not string equality. And this annoyed me for so long because I didn't realize that that was a thing. So because the two strings are actually parsed into numbers and they're both equal to zero, I think. Yes. Let's talk about PHP. <laughs> if I declare three separate variables, uh, infinity array and an array casted as an object, I think they're supposed to be things. Um, but what you end up getting is a cyclic equality loop where one is bigger than the other, is bigger than the other, is bigger than the other, infinity. That's fun. Let's talk about PowerShell. Haha. <laughs> So if I want to check if 2 is larger than 1, it'll print true, else it'll print false. So what's this going to be? Is 2 larger than 1? It'll be true. If I want to do the other way around, is 2 less than 1, what's it going to print out? No, it's not, because that operand is actually reserved for fear the loose. Because the greater than symbol does greater than, the less than symbol doesn't do less than. My point is that all languages have quirks. Yes, some are more used, less used than others. Some of them have communities that like to uh, bash down other languages. Some of them have big communities where you can see all the noise. Some have smaller communities where you can't. But hopefully, I've been able to show you that this uh, very popular, very extensively used language does have some really nice things, but some things you have to watch out for. And hopefully, this will stop some people yelling about it on the internet, maybe. I don't know. But thank you. I also love feedback. Do, do the feedback thing. And if do I have time? Yes. I have time. I could answer maybe some questions, actual questions. Like, um, if you have an extended question, you can ask me later. But little questions for now are good. And I will continue to jabber until the microphones run around. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Katie, for a fantastic talk. That was incredibly entertaining. Um, you've raised a huge number of issues with functional languages that you covered in your talk. What do you see as the path to resolve them? Understanding, mostly. Um, the thing is that, so I wasn't going to mention it in the talk because I don't really think I could support the statement, but Douglas Crockford actually said that lambdas have been popularized by JavaScript because JavaScript is actually functional. But it's kind of not, but it kind of is. But it's, it's one of those sort of tittering ones. But the thing is, you've got functional programming and object-oriented programming. And there's, there's this whole sort of vitriol. I mean, if you do a functional programming talk at an object-oriented conference, you get heckled. If you do an object-oriented talk at a 
functional programming conference, you get heckled. But hopefully, these kind of talks will help with the understanding that each have positives and negatives, and the actual technical issues are more of foot gun that may have reasons why it can't be fixed, and if you know about them, you can avoid them, sort of thing, which is why the JavaScript, the Good Parts book, was written 10 years ago. A whole lot of that stuff in there is still true, it's still valid because backwards compatibility, and if people just understand that these things exist, then yeah, it's all about knowledge. How do we stop people keeping bugs just for backwards compatibility and encourage people to not rely on bugs, fix their code? How, how do we how do create we... languages where we can actually fix well, bugs? Well, if you want to create your own language, go right ahead. <laughs> That's just going to make more bugs. Maybe. Um, again, with the knowledge thing, if you know that these things exist and aren't supposed to be there, then you shouldn't rely on them. But in this particular case, these things will never get fixed because there wasn't that understanding. If there was any sort of versioning that was included, we could do that, like with Python 2, Python 3, and all this kind of fun stuff. But understanding that some of these things might, I don't want to say lost cause because there are fixes happening, but there's a whole lot of things that literally cannot be fixed. And it's that information knowing that these things are there and not relying on them. And I, I don't know how to fix that apart from trying to share information. Hello. Could I, um, is an answer to that maybe that we just, we need in some situations a sort of deprecated message and. Deprecation you know. is fun. Um, I recall a whole lot of hatred when jQuery started trying to put in deprecation things to the point where people weren't upgrading jQuery to the point where there's actually been um, security vulnerabilities in jQuery to do with uh, possibly cross-site scripting and people didn't want to update because deprecated things and so they're being subjected to other things and you, you, the whole pros and cons of There are always some people that are going to want the insecure version. Yes. Come to my uh, tutorial tomorrow. We'll see just how fun that turns out to be. One um, last question. The general yes. answer to that one tends to be to use some kind of pragma, a bit like um, Perl's famous use strict, where you say, well, you could say a lot of Perl's non-strictness is a bug. Um, a lot of older code was incompatible with becoming strict, so you have to declare, hey, I'm being strict. And the same thing applies to JavaScript and, and other yeah, languages. Yeah, there is, there is a strict in JavaScript. Yeah. I didn't have enough time to work so. out whether that was a thing or not. But if you're creating new applications, try to keep to strict using yeah. ECMA, script, six stuff, polyfill what you need, not what you can, because that will come in later. And you just need to know the mechanisms that your language has and what foot guns it has, because that thing in Perl is weird. <laughs> <laughs> We can talk about that later. Okay, sure. There's no further questions. Thank you, Katie. But here's something to remember as well.